I'm going to end this analysis of the new song by Jordy Greep, Holy Holy, with like one of the stupidest comparisons I've ever made. Uh, but before we get there, let's talk about the song in general. You know, I have to admit, this is not a song that I wanted to like. You know, I, I don't like it when bands I like break up, and I like Black Midi, and I saw them in concert, and all that, and I met them, and it was super nice, and... I really liked what they were doing. I thought they could build a lot of great stuff. And the thing about bands when they break up, you know, they're sort of like the good and the bad. And like the good is, you know, that you have these individuals who have maybe been bound by some sense of camaraderie, some sense of uh, communal well good, who are then sort of free to break out and become individuals. I was actually watching an interview with John Lennon, like literally yesterday, and he, it was 1971, and he was all like, you know, isn't it great that we have all this great music, that all four of us are making such great music? You know, that's the upside. You know, that's the upside. And the other thing is that what, what it can do is it can allow you to sort of, or allows artists to, to be more of who they are. It's like taking off a restrictor plate. They're just going forward and forward and forward. So on the one hand, I didn't want to like it, and I didn't. I didn't like the song at first. Now, oof. I was not a fan. And I've come around on the song, obviously. That's why I'm talking about it. Always positive and whatnot. But I didn't want to like it because I like Black Midi. And what are the instincts? What is Jordy without the controlling aspects of the other two? And I don't know if it's pronounced Jordy or Gordy. I don't know. I know how it would be pronounced in many parts of the world. I actually don't. I feel like every time I talk about this band, I mispronounce the man's name. I'll just call him Greep from now on, because I'm pretty sure I know how to pronounce that. What is Greep's desire? What does he want to do that he couldn't do with Black Midi? And when I listened to this for the first time, I was like, what the happy hell is this musical theater? What is this samba? What is this Steely Dan ass weirdness? And really what I think I ultimately arrived on, it wasn't really Steely Dan or musical theater. What I think is, what I think we're realizing is I think what we're getting is a lot of Zappa energy. Now I don't just mean the fact that we have a very demanding, excellent guitar player who is a little bit socially awkward, but also uh, quite powerful. That's not really what I mean. I mean something more, where if you really listen to a lot of Zappa, he was able to make great art that was imitations of insincere art. I mean, like, his earliest work was doing this great stuff with doo-wop, and I don't think he's, like, making fun of doo-wop, but he's also sort of making fun of doo-wop. And he would do a lot of stuff sort of almost like game show music, where he'd seem to be sort of making fun of it and not. I mean, uh, even pop songs, you know, he would, uh, he would cover Happy Together with the Turtles, 1971. This sort of sense of what you're never really quite sure, what is his position on the music that's being played? What, what, is, what, is, his, what is his place? And that's my question about Greep that we got going here. What, 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 what's his position on this music that he's making? What is this musical game show music? It feels like game show. It feels like it's a game show. It's an opening to a game show. We're going to play a game with, with your host, Gordy, don't call me Jordy Greep, right? But that's not what it's about. It's about the manosphere. Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who's going to talk. I usually talk about the music first and then get into the words, but I'm not going to. I'm going to start with the words, because I, the words, let's face it, they are even more than the music, I think, the center of this song. Now, when, when we think about... About, about Hellfire and about a lot of the themes. I, I did a whole take on it. I compared it to Faulkner. And I also compared certain parts of it to Jacques Brel and Jacques Brel's song, O Suivant. That's A-U space S-U-I-V-A-N-T. An amazing song all about uh, an army guy, you know, a guy in the army who's waiting in line to see a prostitute who was hired by the army. And it's about his like existential horror having to be the next and next and next. Please excuse the summer sounds. I have a six-day-old baby upstairs. I have a two-year-old baby in the next room. I'm just trying to get this out there. I'm a little bit cooped up, I'm going to be honest. The semester's about to start, and I'm busy as hell, but I'm a little cooped up, and I'm excited to talk about music here. So you have to excuse the, the summer sounds of the cicadas and the, and the, and the tufted tit mice that fly behind me. So this whole idea that I really thought was an was a interesting thing on here was a kind of pathetic masculinity, a sort of sniveling, whinging, oh, I want to get off, but I don't feel great about it, which I do think is part of this, this great sexual frustration that's in this song. That's about this sort of almost incel theme. Now, the entire song is interesting because it's told, in, it's told backwards. 
it's essentially a narrative of a John. A John is a generic term for a, a customer of a prostitute. All right, and so it's the story of a John told in reverse. It's kind of a tragedy. It's a tragedy of this loser who presents himself in one way in the beginning, and then you learn about the truth at the end, and he just seems more and more pathetic to where if you listen to the song on repeat as I have, it just gets sadder and sadder and sadder. And it's, it's a, such a tragedy because it's also a question of, you know, you know how they always say, you know, just fake it till you make it, you know? Like if you don't have confidence, you know, if you don't know how to talk to girls or whatever, just fake it till you make it, you know? Fake it till you make it. Hey, don't ever say that to somebody. I used to not have confidence. I used to not know how to talk to women. I couldn't just fake it. I couldn't just do anything. People kept telling me, oh, hey, just be insouciant. Oh, thank you for the suggestion, brah. I'll be insouciant. Let me get right on that insouciance for you. Okay, the whole problem is it's like capitalism. You need money to make money. You need confidence to have confidence, which is <laughs> why it's totally unfair, because the more confidence you have, the easier it is to have confidence. How do you fake it till you make it? This song is making fun of, in a way, is attacking this man, in a way, I'm going to call this man John. I'm going to call the protagonist of this song John, because he is a John. But I feel sympathy for him. How do you fake it till you make it? You can't. Now, the first time you listen to it, it's extremely uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable listen, all right? Because I'm sitting here, I listened to it right here on this porch yesterday for the first time. It's like this rock star swagger. It's kind of uncomfortable rock star swagger. And you get the sense, well, maybe he's talking about his life. Maybe Greep is trying to describe himself. Now, I, I remember meeting him, you know, last year. It was great at a, at a concert, at a backstage pass, whole thing. And I had a very easy time uh, speaking with the other members, especially the drummer, Morgan Simpson. He's very, very, very friendly with my son, who's also a drummer. And, and I remember, you know, understanding that, that Jordy Greep was, was, was perfectly pleasant totally kind, went above and beyond to meet me. But I could also tell it wasn't really his thing. Meeting people, shaking hands, having to make nice because somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, it's not his thing. Please do not construe that as a criticism. It's some people's thing, it's other people's not thing, right? So it's interesting because that's my image of this person is of this great musician, amazing musician. I mean, the way that he performed, oh my God, that he could play all those things and sing all those things and do that, while at the same time, in real life, being sort of shy and retiring, it makes sense with this song, where we have this tale of John, and then we have this, this bravado of this person singing it. And what's interesting is it's like this whole beginning is such a good imitation of pick up sleaze lines. You know, it starts right off, uh, you know, right off the first verse with I could tell you are lonely. And this whole thing is like based on, it feels like it's very much of the moment. I said it's about the manosphere. If you don't know what the manosphere is, congratulations, you lived a better life than most of us. The manosphere is a whole thing on the internet where men perceive of women as prizes to be won and games to be, uh, to be victorious. So you have to learn how to play women in order to win women, in order to gain them and to possess their bodies sexually. Okay, there's a lot of terms. One of these terms is called red pill. That's where you see the truth about women and that women just want this and men just want that. In order to be a high value male, you have to do this. In order to attract high value women, you have to be like this. All this kind of really uh, unsettling, unfortunate mentality that once again, the internet did not invent this. Okay, a lot of these things that are in the incel sphere, that are in the manosphere are things that I thought when I was younger. I didn't believe them, but I thought them. I sort of thought all of these things. I thought like, like an incel. The only thing that the internet did is it made a place where people could get together and then they could take their thoughts and turn those thoughts into beliefs. It never it was a belief of mine. I never believed in the inferiority of women, but I suspected that maybe I'm not such a piece of garbage. Maybe they're a piece of garbage. Maybe I thought that once, okay? So this is very much in our time of our moment, a story of somebody who is very much red pill. That's a red pill, pathetic love story. And the way that he understands, the way you have to understand this is that the second half of the song is all about the man telling the woman what to do. So the first half of the story is the woman and the man and the man getting to have this fantasy, getting to play out this fantasy that he paid for. He wrote this script. He's like a director. He wrote a script and he did it. 
So the second half is him paying her, and the first half is how it acts out. This is how he wants the world to be, okay? This is a real Rupert Pupkin kind of situation, if you've seen King of Comedy, okay? And it's clear that the way he perceives of women is what he's paying for. He's paying for this woman to behave in a way that he perceives of women behaving. So he negs her and says, don't tell me I'm the first, and tries to make her less than, and tries to impress other people by everybody knows me. And there's so much insistence on everybody knows me because that's the truth. What's the song really about? What's it really about? Why, 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 why do men want high value women? Because they want to be high value. It has nothing to do with the women. That's the problem. That's the issue. The question is, it's never about the women, it's about status. This man wants status. That's it. He feels small in his life. It's not even really about sex, as we will see. It is about status. It is about being at the lowest rung of status. That's what red pills are about, too. That's what the manosphere is about. Am I going to say it's about capitalism? No, but you can go ahead and jump ahead. You can jump ahead if you want. If you want to skip to the end in your mind, you can probably say it's about the way that, uh, that, that our sort of late-stage capitalism has, has reduced our understanding of ourselves into some kind of market economy of what we can exchange for goods and services, okay? But anyways, so, so that, that, that's the first verse. Then it goes to the chorus. Everybody knows I'm holy, I'm holy revolutionaries and okay now here's a part where I'm I have to hear the rest of the album I have to get to the rest of the album I don't have the rest of the album yet it's not out yet because there is a way to read this where it's not about sex and it's not about low value men who want to be high value men that it's not about the manosphere that's actually about religion because he says the revolutionaries and the jihadis know me maybe this is actually about religion and about the way religions act as though they seduce people, that they bring people in when really most religious power is coerced out of the people who they control. Most people who are faithful are either uh, either have a gun pointed to their head to believe in something or their grandparents or great grandparents or great 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 grandparents or great 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 grandparents or great 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 grandparents. Most religions start with a gun to the head, okay, or a sword to the neck if you want to get old school with it. So, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this is a correlation between a priest and a John fundamentally being the same, using power or money uh, to get the imitation of satisfaction from other people. But I don't think that's what the song's about, but that is a reading that's possible. We get to the second verse, where the music gets a little bit more melismatic, a little bit slicker. I've had them all before. I'll have you too. The music changes in this kind of... Havana bit where it's trying to sound, I guess, like Samba. But then the, the second chorus ends, and this is the crucial part. On the dance floor, I'm holy. How about we take this further? I'll meet you in the bathroom. I bet your pussy is holy too. This is crucial because this is the whole point. This guy who has been slick, who has presented himself as slick, who has seemed like Mr. Suave, like Mr. Like Sean Connery. Oh, 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 Sean Connery. You know, kind of a Sean Connery in Dr. No, James Bond fantasy. This is where it clips because he says something that is just idiosyncratic. This is a lot like when Travis Bickle uh, takes Sybil Shepard's character uh, to, uh, to, the, to the porno theater in Taxi Driver, okay? This is like a part where a lot of times men, they, they, can, they can fake it till they make it. They can counterfeit some kind of sense of comfort and joy and ease with women, but then at a certain point, they just get sweaty. They get sweaty like me on my hot ass porch, okay? Where they just go, they just, they just kind of, I bet you pussy for all too. Just that's the turn. That's the turn in the song. He goes too far. Behind every Andrew Tate is this, okay? This is the truth. This is the truth behind Andrew Tate. That's what the song is about. This is the truth behind every single pickup artist, behind the mystery, okay? This is the truth that is behind all of this, is just some sweaty guy who's hoping to pay you so that he can say to you, I bet your pussy's holy, okay? Gah. Am, I, am I getting like sunburn on the back of my neck? If I get sunburn on the back, have you liked my video yet? Have you smashed like bucket and subscribe? I gotta get out of the, the I'm potentially in the sun here, like in the, in, in the back of my, so I gotta make sure that didn't happen. And then we get to this whole crazy ending where he explains the entire setup. Act like we've never met. How much will that cost? Act like you are unsure of yourself. I want you to look at me as though I'm attractive. I want your eyes to say, take me. I want your lips to be unimpressed. Can I tell you something? 
this is not somebody coming from the outside. This is not somebody who has never felt this way. This is somebody who has felt this way. I know because I felt this way. If you caught me when I was, let's see, I had my first date when I was 19 years old. Okay, 19 years old, uh, the first time I kissed a girl, I was 19, all right? You catch me when I'm like around 18, 18 and a half. Oh man, this right here is like my internal monologue. This is all I wanted women and girls to do, okay? I didn't know, I didn't understand that I was a little insult. The internet didn't exist at that point. But all of these ideas, everything that he wants, it's so relatable and it's so pathetic. I want you to ask the waiter if I really am who I am. I want you to blush. I want you to shoot a smug look at the other girls. And when I tell you your pussy is holy, I want you to slap me and then kiss me. Make sure everyone's watching. Kiss me and then walk away. Uh, walk to the bathroom. I'll follow after. Don't worry. We won't do anything. We'll just loiter there for 15 minutes or so. Then I'll choose your new lipstick and walk back out. There's no sex. There's no sex. There's no sex in this song. There's no sex in this song. There's no sex in this song because the song's not about sex. It's about status. It's about feeling small. This man feels small, that's the problem. It's not that he's even horny, it's that he feels small, it's that he feels worthless. It's not a sex song. <laughs> he just feels small. They're just sitting in the bathroom. This woman's getting paid all this money to look like she wants to have sex with him and she doesn't even have to have sex with him. I want you to tell me I'm a perfect dancer. I want you to tell me I smell great. I want you to make me look taller. Could you kneel down the whole time? How much will that cost? Would you, if I want you to put your hand on my knee, will that be all right? That's the saddest line. That's the saddest line in a song that's already sad. Would that be all right? Will that be all right? Because he doesn't know. He's trying to act like he's all tough. The whole fake John that he's putting forward, the fake John that he's putting forward is a total lie. He's not this like, like insulting, suave, negging person. He's saying, would that be all right? I want you to look at me as if you're lost. How much will that cost? How much will that cost? It's totally, it's an impotent song. He's impotent. He can't do anything. He's doing nothing. Okay. There's, there's like that old joke, you know, that a lot of people get prostitutes and then they just go to the hotel room and they just cry the whole time. This is a song kind of like that. Now, as far as the music goes, I'm not going to spend that much time on it because there's so much to do. When it starts off, it sounds very black midi with these crunchy guitars. Uh, oh, also, if you like the video, smash the like bucket, subscribe. AVAA stands for awesome videos always. Have you seen my the zine that I'm in? It's called Post Punks Not Dead. Look it up on uh, on Instagram. You can download it for free. Uh, they didn't pay me anything. I just did it because it's a bunch of uh, young people who like just are nutty about this music, and uh, I really enjoy that enthusiasm. So if you like Black Midi, you like any of this kind of stuff, uh, go go read the zine. Okay, they're not paying me. There's no money. <laughs> I tell you what, they gave me 100% of their budget, uh, which was nothing. Uh, anyways, so you know it starts off kind of technical, but then it's this guitar solo and this great sort of soft, jazzy, talk show feeling. And then during the first verse, the hardest drumming, maybe the hardest thing I've ever heard done by a drummer is that the music slows down for like a half beat. Like there's an intentional screw up on the rhythm where it just, it. I don't even know. I don't even know. It's something so bizarre that I don't even know if Zappa's ever done it. Tell me in the comments if you're a Zappa head, where's the part where he, forces his drummer to actually lose time for a brief period of time. There's so many chords, so many different parts. This Brazilian, like Brazilian sounds and samba on the saxophone behind and the choir becomes holy, holy becomes, it's straight up like a musical. It's straight up, it's a straight up, it's a musical. It's a musical. It's a musical. It's a weird musical about a weird pill, red, red pilled weirdo, weird pill redo. Holy, holy, and then I just, I, I love the way it breaks into all these different sounds. I, maybe, maybe the thing about this, sorry, the sun is just so aggressive. Maybe the thing about this whole thing is that he is abandoning his three piece so that he can have like 15 people on stage because this music, I get the sense, is just going to be nuts. It's just going to be like so many people on stage. It's just so great. You know, the song itself is six minutes long. The, the, the shift, the... The punchline to the song happens three minutes, 28 seconds long. Uh, I also watched the video, which is bowling, which is fun because he's bowling, but then you see that the, all of the pins are actually on strings, so it was all done that way. Is Jesse Eisenberg in this video? I think he is. I think he is. The whole list of demands is going, and then we see like a snooker hall. I don't even know what snooker is. And then when, when he says, uh, I'll see you next week, 
I'll see you next week. Like his voice like goes off key. It's very much like in the beginning of the song, we have that whole bit where the drums kind of fall off. The singing kind of falls off. He's just this pathetic, pathetic guy. What is snooker, by the way? I don't know. I've never understood. What's the difference between snooker and pool? I've played a lot of pool, but I haven't played snooker. The point is we have the, this man at the end who's just sort of living this life and feeling lonely and pathetic and lost. And in his mind, if he could imitate success with women, he could imitate having status and not feeling small. I told you I'd have a stupid point for you. There's an episode of Modern Family. Uh, I believe it's the 13th episode of the first season in which Phil pretends to be, a, a, they role play as people who meet at a bar. <laughs> and she's basically like a high, high class escort and he's in town on business. He's called Clive Bixby and she's Juliana. And it's a very funny skit uh, because he doesn't know how to like, <laughs> he doesn't really know how to do it and he keeps on making these mistakes. But the whole time I'm listening to this, I'm thinking of that scene. So I don't know. My theory is that they were like on tour and Greep saw this on TV and then created this whole mythology around it. I told you it was a ridiculous point. All right, well, I have to go back in, check on my two-year-old, check on my six-day-old, check on my 16-year-old who's studying for the SATs. Wish her luck. It's tomorrow. I'm going to release this video, like, right now because I just feel like it. All right. Well, then, until next time, there's the camera.